This is Bill Farmer again. Welcome back to Software Engineering 2FA3 Discrete Mathematics with Applications 2. Today we're going to start a whole new topic, finite automata and regular expressions. Here's an outline for the topic. Um, we're going to look at theory of computation, string operations, modular arithmetic, decision procedures, or excuse me, decision problems, deterministic finite automata, non-deterministic finite automata, regular expressions, and then applications and other topics. The first four of these are basically background material, which we will start today. So the first part of this is theory of computation. So what is theory of computation? So theory of computation is the study of the foundations of computation. Basically, it's trying to figure out what computation is, what, what makes computation computation. And it's concerned with the following questions. What does it mean for a function to be computable? What can and cannot be computed? What does computational, how does computational power depend on computational mechanisms? So different computational mechanisms provide different computational power. How do we classify computational functions? So one of the tools of the theory of computation are models of computation. Models of computation allow us to study the nature of computation, and there's various different kinds of models of computation. So two examples are automata and grammars. And in this topic, we will be looking at both of these models of computation very closely. So automata, an, an automaton is an abstract ma machine that performs computation. So it allows us to study certain kinds of computation, namely the computation that a particular abstract machine can do. And we're going to be interested in three categories of automata finite automata with finite memory. They're called finite automata because they basically have finite memory. Push down automata, which have finite memory and a stack. The stack can have unlimited memory, but how you access it is controlled like a stack. And then finally, Turing machines with unlimited memory. The second kind of model are grammars. So a grammar is just a set of rules for generating the expressions of a language. And we are interested in three kinds of grammars, regular grammars, context-free grammars, and unrestricted grammars. Each of these grammars generates a different category of languages. Um, now these three grammars are three of the four types of grammars in the Chomsky hierarchy. Um, so these are types 1, 2, and 4. The third type are context-sensitive grammars. We'll talk a little bit about these, but, but these are not nearly as important to us as the other three kinds. And the interesting thing is if we look at these models of computation, um, these three grammars, they correspond to the three kinds of automata, which I've mentioned previously. So. So here we have these three kinds of, kinds of automata, and they correspond to these three kinds of grammar. That's one of the main themes of this topic. OK, so let's move on to string operations. So we need to talk about strings and how we manipulate them. This is important background material. So when we want to talk about strings, we have to start with an alphabet. And an alphabet is just a finite set of symbols. And we're going to represent it by sigma. Uh, now, that's all it is. It's just a finite set of symbols. Then a string is a finite sequence of symbols. Uh, and a string over sigma is a finite sequence of symbols in sigma. So if we when I have the set of all strings over sigma, we will represent that like this. 
So be represented um, by sigma with a star asterisk. Now, um, the empty string is an important string. It's a string which is the empty sequence, a string coring, it's an empty sequence of symbols from sigma. And we're going to represent that by the Greek letter epsilon. And so every, for every alphabet, epsilon is going to be a member of the set of all strings of that alphabet. And if our alphabet is the empty set, then the set of all strings of that alphabet will be exactly the set of one string, the empty string. And so if we were going to write down a sequence, there's, there's different ways of writing it. One way you could use is these angle brackets. You could write down a sequence like this with round brackets. Sometimes people will, will use square brackets. But we're going to think of a string as just being written down like this or we can put quote marks on the outside. But remember, all a string is, is a finite sequence of symbols from an alphabet. Okay, so we're gonna talk about some operations in strings. The first one is concatenation. Uh, so if we have uh, two strings, here's one, here's two, and I call the first one X, I call the first one Y, the concatenation of x and y, which I write just by putting them together, that's going to be this string. It's the string of x followed by the string of y. So that's concatenation. And then I can measure the length of the string basically by the number of, of symbols in the sequence corresponding to the string. So if we have here the empty sequence, the length is going to be zero because there are no symbols. Otherwise, if we have a string like this, you can see here that there's going to be n plus one members, then the length will be n plus one. Then rep repetition is concatenating a string with itself. And so I can take a string x, concatenate with itself n times, and I get the empty string if n is zero. And otherwise, I get that string concatenated with itself n times. OK, so now let's look at operations and sets of strings. So let a and b be subsets of sigma star. That means a and b are sets of strings. So we have the usual set, theory, set theoretic operations. We have union. So we have union here, intersection, and we have complement. And Complement is sometimes ambiguous because you need to know what set this is sitting into, sitting in. So if we think of this box as the set of all, um, this is a set of all strings, and then if we have a subset of strings like A, then the complement of A will be everything outside of it, like this. Now we can also concatenate two sets of strings. So if we concatenate A and B, then that's going to be the set of all X strings X, Y, where X comes from A and Y comes from B. And one thing to notice is, suppose that we have A, and for B we have the empty string. So in that case, we, we would have the empty I should say the empty set here. So this would be all x, y, where x comes from a, y comes from the empty set. But there is no member of the empty set. So that means in that case, and in the case when, where the first set is empty, uh, the result will be that we'll have the empty set. So the concatenation of two sets is the empty set if either one of these sets is empty. Now we can define the power set. If we take a set of strings and that set of strings to the nth power, if n is zero, it's going to be the set of exactly one string, the empty string. Otherwise, it's going to be 
the concatenation of n with itself n times. Um, now, another operation is the asterisk. If we have a star, that equals a union of all these powers, where we have the zeroth power, which is just this, the first power, second power. We take the union of all of these. It's an infinite union. And that will be uh, a star, or a, the asterisk. And the asterisk is thus the set of all strings over A. So, so in a sense, in this case, um, you, you can um, yeah, you can think of this as a set of all strings over A. And this is also called the Kleene star or the Kleene closure. And the positive asterisk is exactly like the asterisk, except we take out the empty string. So it's, in other words, it's a set of all strings from A that have length one or greater. Okay, so the last thing I want to do today is I would like to ask you a question, which of the following mathematical structures is not a monoid? And I'll go through these. So we have the set of all strings from sigma with the empty string and string concatenation, the power set of all uh, strings formed from sigma. So these are going to be the, all the subsets of sigma star. And we have uh, the set of the empty string and set concatenation and then we have the same power set with the empty set in union, same power set with sigma star and intersection. So I'll give you a moment. Which of these is not a monoid? That's the question. OK, welcome back. It turns out that they are all monoids. So what do we have to do to verify that these are monoids? Well. We have to make sure that each of these operations, when I apply a string concatenation uh, to two strings in this set, I'm going to get back a string in this set. We have to verify that. We have to verify that when I apply set concatenation to two uh, sets in this power set, we're going to get something back in the power set, which we do. Same way when we have union. We have to verify that if we take two sets in the power set and union them, we'll get back something in the power set of the union. And same way with intersection. All that's true. What that's basically saying is that these sets are closed under these four operations. Uh, the next thing we have to do is make sure that these four operations are associative. Um, that, that is true. So remember associative means if we have an operation, I'll say it's dot, it satisfies, oops, sorry, it satisfies this formula. Yeah, actually, I wrote this all wrong. Let me try again. It satisfies this formula. basically says if I'm if I have um, I'm applying my operation to three things if I apply it to the first two and then apply the result to the second one that's the same as applying uh, the result to the last two and then applying the first one to that so yes these are all associative and the final thing we have to make sure is that these second components are identity elements with respect to to these operations. So in this case, the first case is that if we take concatenation of a string with the with the um, epsilon, we're going to always get back the thing we start with. In the second case, if we have a set and we have set concatenation with the set of epsilon, that also acts as an identity element. 
And in this case, um, if we take the union of a set with the empty set, that's the same as taking the union of the empty set, the, the empty set with that set, which is the same as A, so that is identity element. And the last case, if we take the intersection of, um, uh, let me write it like this, if we take the intersection of a set with epsilon star, that's the same as taking epsilon star intersection with A, which equals A. So in all cases, these are the identity elements for these operations. And therefore, all four of these, all four of these are monoids. And I think I said previously that monoids are very common in computing. This is evidence for that statement. Okay, we're done. Uh, we're going to continue next time with modular arithmetic. Until then, have a good day.